the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So a couple weeks ago, when I looked at the gospel for today, and I looked at the calendar and saw that First Baptist was coming, and we'd invited Vinny to come preach, uh, and um, the Baptist tradition often doesn't use a lectionary the way that we do, I felt it was uh, incredibly unfair to invite this nice uh, man to come and preach and then give him this gospel uh, to have to uh, interpret to two congregations. So, uh, um, so we called him and said, you get to pick the scriptures. So you're the only uh, congregation uh, being burdened by this parable this morning. So, um, and I know I've done this before uh, on a time when I'm preaching at the 8 o'clock but not at the 10.15 that I, I, I preach more of a Bible study. Uh, but I assure you it's because of the text uh, and the importance of us unraveling and digging deeper into the text um, that I give you more a, a whole pile of notes to take home and synthesize uh, than necessarily a clear sermon. But this is probably the most difficult parable to unpack. And the gift of parables are that there is more unpacking to do, that uh, Jesus usually gives us enough clarity that we understand the meaning, uh, but enough openness that we continually reinterpret it into our own lives, that the, the parables still matter. They still uh, guide us in our modern lives uh, as much as it did in the first century. Uh, this parable often uh, doesn't even give us enough to, to guide us unless we open it up. But I do think once we open it up, it may give us more fruit uh, than most other, uh, other parables. First of all, some things to know uh, going into this parable. And I do think uh, at its core, it is an economic parable. And the tools we use to figure out what a parable means is usually the context. Last week, I talked about the context being uh, that Jesus was at dinner with the Pharisees and Sadducees. They were criticizing him uh, for the people that he chose to eat with. You eat with sinners and the, the notorious uh, 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 people of, unworthy, uh, of unworthiness. Uh, how do you do that uh, and keep yourself clean? How do you do that uh, and represent the, uh, uh, the law? Uh, and he tells the parables of the lost coin, and he tells the parable of the lost sheep, and then eventually the parable of the prodigal. This is the very beginning of a new chapter. And so we, we, can, we have no context other than the fact that this conversation may still be continuing at the dinner table uh, and that he's just picking up where he left off. Uh, and the 16th chapter has two parables about wealth. This is the first one. Also of note, uh, when you look at the geography uh, of the Holy Land in that time, uh, the north had the best farmland. They had great lands for producing olives, so olive oil, for producing grapes, for wine, and producing wheat. Three commodities that the Romans truly valued. The south, on the other hand, Judah had, uh, Judea had more money, a lot more money, but didn't have those valuable resources to the Romans. And Romans, when they came in and occupied the territory, uh, they levied high taxes. That was the way that they... Um, uh, uh, that they filled their coffers um, and, and maintained control. And so they would tax both, uh, but the people in the, uh, uh, in the north weren't able to pay the taxes. So the folks in the south uh, benevolently came and said, you know what, we'll bail you out. Don't you worry about it. We'll take care of you. We'll cover your taxes. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind just signing over your land to us, um, and we'll, we'll just take the deed of the land, but we'll pay the taxes, and then we'll charge you a certain portion of your, uh, of your harvest, a, a certain amount of wheat, a certain amount of olive oil, a certain amount of grapes um, or, or wine. Uh, and that's how they wielded their, their power. And so uh, you can imagine that eventually as the system became a little bit uh, more oppressive that the owner of the land, who'd never actually farmed a day of their lives, uh, was sort of persona non grata uh, up in the north. And so they would send a messenger, uh, a, a manager to come and collect uh, what, what was duly theirs. Uh, and uh, one other thing that we know from this system, uh, from other uh, chapter, uh, chapters in Luke and from uh, the Gospels itself um, and history, is that everybody in the system lined their pockets uh, by padding what was charged to the people beneath them. 
We know tax collectors made their, uh, their living by charging more than the taxes due. Uh, we know from the third chapter of Luke that soldiers, the Roman soldiers, would uh, uh, supplement their income by not only the spoils of their victory, but uh, using the might of their sword uh, to extort more money. Uh, and we know that uh, the interest charged uh, uh, would, would be an oppressive, uh, uh, oppre oppressive tax and that the manager would uh, line his pockets uh, so that he would get a little bit more, um, a little bit more by uh, increasing how much is due to, uh, to the owner and then taking that for himself. So we have all the different cogs in the system when this parable plays out. And remember, Jesus uses things that were fairly ubiquitous uh, in his parables, things that people were familiar with. And this economic system was very familiar, as familiar as a sheep and a shepherd or a lost coin. Uh, and he uses this story. Um, and so the story begins with uh, a manager who's running the properties, and uh, we don't know whether he is uh, extorting a tremendous amount, not, not collecting uh, what he's supposed to be collecting, um, uh, we, or, uh, or just holding on to some of his, his profits. But, uh, but rumors are swirling that he is a uh, dishonest manager, that he is uh, not collecting the full revenue uh, that the owner should be receiving. And so the owner says... You're canned. And the guy all of a sudden takes a different look at the economic system that he's participating in. He takes a step back and says, my goodness, I'm going to be beneath the bottom because I don't even have a farm or farming skills. Uh, you know, my back isn't hardened from years of work. I have no place in this economic system. And all of a sudden, I imagine he was a lot more sympathetic to the way that the system kept uh, grinding and closing in on those at the bottom of it. And so we decided what to do. We said, I need to ingratiate myself with those at the other end of the economic system. I need to switch teams. I need to be on the poor, uh, on the side of the poor, uh, because at very least they'll take me into their house. And so he goes uh, and he renegotiates with everyone. Uh, and a manager has the voice of his owner. Uh, this is a pride culture. Uh, whatever he says uh, goes because the owner would never uh, say, he didn't have permission to do that. This is his hand. And so he plays his hand well. He says, the owner, in his incredible generosity, has said, you can pay 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, you can give me 50 uh, of the 100 that you owe. And you can give me 80 of the 100 that you know. And he collects. Uh, and when he brings it back, uh, he's commended, which is sort of the shocking part of it. And we don't know whether he's commended because uh, the owner just says, well played. I got no moves. Uh, you know, I can't say that you, yeah, you didn't have my voice because you do. Uh, and if I go back to him and ask him for more, there'd be so much shame involved in that. I couldn't play that card. Well done. You win. But I think what Jesus is commending is the fact that even out of desperation, remember the story that just the preceded, the story of the prodigal, is not a great uh, story of somebody who realizes all the evils that he did uh, and goes to repent. It's somebody who got desperate and was tired of living with the pigs and came home out of desperation. Uh, and it was the father uh, that wouldn't even let him apologize, that wouldn't even let him tell his, his story that he'd been crafting. Um, and this is a story of someone who out of desperation steps outside of the economic system uh, that has been like a vice on the poor um, and looks at it a little differently and switches to and sides with the poor. And so economically, you can look at it as a parable where Jesus invites us uh, to step outside of the economic systems that we participate in and look with the lens of the poor. Look how the systems that we participate in affect the poor. So that's the economic view of this parable. Uh, but it's not that clear. As we notice, Luke sort of spends uh, a good bit of time after the parable ends uh, with uh, several pithy comments as if he's trying to summarize but isn't quite sure what it means himself. Um, and so one of the other pieces, if we go back to what happened right before, we realize this wasn't so much about wealth um, as it is about uh, using money to talk about um, uh, debts and forgiveness, much like our Lord's Prayer. And in all of the other parables, the God figure uh, is, either, um, is either the shepherd, the woman looking for the lost coin, or the father who welcomes the son home. Uh, and is it possible 
And I think it can have more than one meaning. I think uh, Jesus can leave a parable open for multiple meanings. Is it possible that it also is about how we represent uh, who we work for, who we serve to God's people? If God is the owner who's never stepped foot on the land, and is charging incredibly exorbitant and punitive damages to people who are already beaten up. And that's how the church is representing God, the owner, to them. Is that truly what we're called to do? Versus uh, when he switches sides and all of a sudden he is a forgiving and merciful God. He's a God who understands, who steps outside and understands the difficulty uh, put upon uh, all of us in our human condition. And is this a story about how we represent God to those who feel heavily burdened by not just economic woes, but by sin and brokenness? And how we represent God uh, transforms those burdens and those debts. So I invite you to take this parable home and chew on it. Because it's meant to be chewed on. I think Luke was chewing on it quite a bit. And I think it is an economic parable. And I think it probably is a parable about sin and forgiveness. I think it's probably a parable about how we represent God to the world. We are God's messengers. We are God's managers. How do we convey God in the way that we treat others, in the way that we forgive others, in the way that we talk about a forgiving and merciful and loving God? So read it, chew on it, and practice it.